Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Romano, and I'm the Education Coordinator with the Base Hospital Program. Thank you for joining us for another webinar presentation. Today we'll be talking about mass casualty incidents and are you ready to respond? Our presenters today are Dr. Chantal Forrestal, who is a PGY3 in Emerge Medicine here in London, Ontario. We've got uh, Sean Doran, who is our local medical director and our medical director for education, and Dr. Mike Peddle, who is a local medical director for CBRME. If this is the first time that you've joined us for a webinar, what you're going to see is a presentation, a typical PowerPoint presentation, and you'll hear our presenters talking over that presentation. Uh, and so without further ado, I will hand the presentation over to our presenters, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay. I'm Chantal, and we're going to be talking about mass casualty incidents today. So our goals for this uh, hour are going to be to describe the mass casualty response, and we'll review the roles of the different responding agencies, and then we will illustrate the application of SALT triage, and we'll go through several examples so you can get some practice and uh, become more familiar with SALT triage. And uh, Chantal, one of the things to remember is uh, we're basing our roles for the responding agencies based on our local experience here with our police, fire, and EMS agencies. So um, some of the discussion may be relevant, some of it may be different depending on where you work and your local responding agencies. So always take that into consideration uh, as we go through this presentation. Perfect. So the first thing that happens with a mass casualty is that dispatch gets a call and they will send EMS, fire, and police to the scene depending on what the call sounds like. And if they think that this is going to be something that requires uh, intensive resources or it's more than 30 minutes drive um, to the nearest hospital, then they might consider activating orange. Exactly. And, and from an orange perspective, uh, it, it always depends on what resources are available in the region at the time as well as where this event is taking place. Um, but uh, depending on the location, the type of event, working on the assumption that it is an MCI and, and the resources are available. Uh, different assets may be sent from various uh, parts within the region or slightly outside that region to try and support uh, the local response. So if you're the EMS uh, team responding to this call, if you're the first truck on scene, it's your job to set up a command post. So uh, with the two medics on the truck, the first medic is going to be responsible for um, calling dispatch and the hospital, and you want to provide pertinent information. So what the scene looks like, approximately how many critical patients you have, and what you expect your ETA to be on the way to the hospital. And as the second medic, you want to begin um, starting the triage process, which we'll go over in detail a little bit later. And typically this truck is also the last truck to leave the site uh, because you are the command post. This is unless a supervisor arrives and relieves you from that duty. Supervisor trucks also have a little bit more uh, equipment, so they have large tarps in the colors uh, for triage so that you can uh, try and facilitate triage by moving patients to the appropriate tarp area if you have uh, that luxury. If you're one of the uh, second or third trucks or any of the other trucks to respond to this uh, scene, then you're just going to assist with triage and transport um, as you're kind of directed by that command post. There's obviously other teams that are there with you. So fire and police are best used when it's an unsafe um, environment. They're going to help you with securing that environment. So fire can help with uh, deploying any hazmat teams, and they have equipment for entering any hazardous environments. And police are very useful if there's uh, concerns about um, a dangerous person or issues with uh, crowd and traffic control at the scene. Remember that fire uh, personnel are also trained in SALT triage, so they wouldn't be your first team to do the triage, but if you require any assistance or if triage is necessary in an unsecure environment that they're able to enter only, then know that they have that skill and can implement it if need be. And that's a local thing, Chantel. I, I'm not uh, sure how other regions have it, but certainly London Fire has worked with uh, with MLEMS and has been part of some SALT training for, for triage. So that's very helpful on scene, like you said, especially because there's sometimes there's going to be places where EMS can't get to initially. Uh, or the, the other thing is just limited resources. There's limited numbers of paramedics available to do triage and transport. Uh, where within, depending on the type of event and the type of 
fire response that's required. We have a number of additional people that are trained that can help in those scenarios. Yeah, and thank you, Mike, for adding that. And I think that um, you make a really good point, and it's probably worthwhile to take a look at what the resources are in your area and maybe find out um, if fire in your area is also trained in that skill. That may be something of value to you in these situations. Uh, so in our local region, this is just an outline of what happens at our hospital here in London when there is one of these mass casualty incidents and your hospital will have a similar protocol in place. But essentially the goals of our code orange protocol when we have a mass casualty incident is to get patients out of the eMERGE department. As we know, bed block can be a bit of an issue. So a big target would be to make beds available and resuscitation spaces available in one of these incidents. The uh, hospitals are also locked down so that we know who is going in and out of the hospital and can kind of control traffic a little bit better. And additional personnel will be called in. And that's why it's very important to make the uh, phone call to uh, dispatch or a patch phone call to the hospital early because those phone calls can help get the additional personnel, whether it be physicians, um, nurses, RTs, or equipment uh, to the hospital that needs to happen early. And uh, there's also an emergency response team, and this team can help uh, coordinate all of this and set up decontamination sites outside the hospital if you do have um, an incident that involves any hazardous materials so that everyone can be decontaminated prior to hospital entry. So again, just to reiterate your role as EMS, um, the biggest thing is you want to set up that command post and coordinate well with fire and police. Use your uh, colleagues as best possible and initiate salt triage. You want to remember that you do have equipment. Uh, every truck does have a MCI bag, at least here in London. There's probably something similar in your region. Um, so we'll go over some of the equipment that trucks will have on board that you can use later and make sure you're using appropriate safety equipment, so your PPE and any hazmat materials. Um, and contact dispatch, as we've already mentioned. One last thing is it's nice to encourage any walking wounded to stay on scene uh, because that way we can avoid overwhelming the hospitals um, with patients who don't need the most immediate care. Yeah, and that's a great, those are some really important points uh, for the EMS on scene uh, and scene management. Uh, from a hospital's perspective, it's really important to get that initial notification. If looking at our previous slide, there's a lot of things that the hospital uh, has to do to prepare for a, a large event like this. Not only do they need to decant the emergency departments, but they have to start preparing ICUs and floor space. They have to deal with radiology as well as ORs currently ongoing and how do you sort of increase the capacity there. Uh, so the earlier we get that notification, the quicker the hospitals can start to spool up and have the internal response as well as if this is a hazmat type thing, how do we, um, how do we then uh, get that emergency response team up and tent set up to get ready for the, uh, for the response. So that's really important. And similarly uh, with the encouraging patients to stay on scene, it allows sort of dis appropriate distribution of patients uh, within the region. So with whenever we have large events like this, making sure that we've got the patients going to the right hospitals and distributing those patients across the system so that we can maintain capacity is really important. Um, and that can only be done through a coordinated system uh, with like EMS transporting. So really important to do that. So we'll talk a bit about the purpose of triage. Um, I think Spock states it the best, with the needs of the many outweighs the needs of the few. So these are situations where we don't have enough resources to provide the best care for every single person um, who's been injured. And so what we want to do is um, provide as good care as we can to as many people as possible. So those who have been severely injured and have a very low chance of any meaningful um, outcome at the end of this tend to get uh, treated last and those with um, you know severe injuries who do have a high chance of meaningful outcome get the majority of the resources. All right so why don't we just before we move on to this sort of triage stuff uh, we've got a couple of questions there uh, looking at sort of the hospital response and so first question that we have is um, talk about what will actually happen to get patients out of the ED. So this is a very challenging um, 
very challenging process. Uh, speaking from an eMERGE perspective, and I'm sure if there's other eMERGE people around, um, bed block and eMERGE and, and space in hospitals that are already at 105 and 110 percent capacity can be challenging. Um, different hospitals will have to come up with different plans. Locally, what we have done is work with the um, bed management uh, people at our hospital to develop what essentially are um, virtual beds uh, based on the various um, units within our hospital, larger units having more virtual beds, smaller units having sm uh, less virtual beds uh, that are designated code orange beds. And so what happens in an event is we would then say, okay, this is a code orange and we're going to institute our process. And our process includes going through the department and assigning all of the patients that are admitted or to be admitted in our department to these virtual beds, which are essentially hallway beds within our facility. Uh, and that allows us to decant our emergency departments to get them upstairs uh, and out and create that space that we need for that initial response. Uh, next question that we have is about a lockdown policy. Um, our hospital does have a lockdown policy and it does have a lockdown process. Uh, I don't have the details to it because it is part of the uh, hospital-based security plan, um, but certainly if people are looking for that information, we can uh, put you in touch with the people that would have that information who could talk to you about how the lockdown is done. Um, Next question is about the hospital emergency response team. So our, our hospital emergency response team has a large number of, of various pe uh, people in, on it. Uh, it ranges from uh, nurses, um, RTs, EDTs. Um, we've had some SSWs, ESWs, as well as uh, clerks uh, within our department are all part of the team. Um, and we're looking at expanding outside of even just the eMERGE group. Um, to be part of that uh, hospital emergency response team, and they're all part of our sort of annual and ongoing training programs. All right. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, we're going to start with a question for you now. So if you could just go ahead and use your polls, um, we're going to ask you what the SALT triage categories are. So I'll give you a few minutes to answer that. All right, so Chantal, I've gone ahead and closed that, and I will release the results. So it looks like we're sitting at 48% uh, answering immediate, delayed, minor, and deceased. And uh, clearly this is information that you'll be going into in the next couple slides. Perfect. So very close. The correct answer is actually B. Um, in SALT triage, there's actually five categories. So the category that's been added is um, essentially the expectant category. And the terminology used is a little different, minimal versus minor, dead versus deceased, but um, that part is not as important. The important part is with SALT, there is this expectant category, which has been added to clarify that even patients who are um, not actually dead, but are low chance of survival, um, that they will get classified in a different category. So if resources allowed, they might be um, able to get some pain management or things like that on board. The, the, I like to call this group, it's kind of the Monty Python of, of uh, salt triage. It's the not dead yet <laughs> category. Um, and the way I look at it is, is they, they aren't dead, but they have significant injuries associated with what's going on and may not be um, resuscitatable or uh, in the current environment. And what that means is, is that that category can change in that as you get more resources and you have more resources available, there's the potential that they are actually resuscitatable, but at the moment they may not be. So here's just our um, color scheme. I apologize. Delayed is usually a yellow, but the colors are not coming across on our presentation very well. But um, in terms of the first people that will get sent with an EMS uh, team to hospital, it will be the people who are categorized as immediate. So these are patients who are um, very significantly injured. They may have an absent peripheral pulse uh, from an injury. They might be in respiratory distress or have um, an uncontrolled hemorrhage, but they are likely to survive. So these patients get triaged um, first and uh, go to the hospital first, followed by um, delayed, minimal, and then as we've already mentioned, there's patients who are already deceased who 
unfortunately we have to leave and expectant who um, get left to last but if we manage to acquire enough resources may get uh, treated or at least some pain management down the road and we'll go through how to triage into these categories in detail so the first step in your salt triage is to uh, decide if patients are able to walk if they are they're going to be the last to be assessed followed by if they're able to move or have purposeful movement they will be the second last group to be assessed and those who are um, still and unmoving are the first to be assessed to determine if they are in fact um, immediate triage or if they are in that um, expectant or dead group. So after you've done that first step, um, you then move on to seeing those patients who um, are not moving and see if you can provide any life-saving interventions. These life-saving interventions would include applying a tourniquet to control a hemorrhage, uh, opening an airway uh, if you can, or um, chest decompression if they seem to have a tension pneumothorax. And these are all things that should take under 30 seconds. You don't want to be spending more than 30 seconds with a patient. So provide your life-saving intervention quickly and then move on. Determine if they're breathing. If they're not, at that point they're deceased. And if they are, then go through these four questions in gray. And we'll go through these questions several times, but um, do they obey commands or make pur purposeful movements? Do they have a peripheral pulse? Um, and if they are not in respiratory distress, um, and if their major hemorrhage is controlled, then um, you can say, if you can say yes to any of those questions, they're either classified as minimal or delayed based on your judgment. And then if any of those questions are a no, then they will be either immediate or expectant, again, based on your judgment as to whether their injuries are survival, survivable. So why are we using SALT triage? There are many different uh, SALT triage um, systems. A lot of you may be familiar with the START system, which is what we used here prior to switching to SALT. Um, a lot of these systems perform very similarly in the literature, but over the last 10 years, there seems to have been a bit more of a push towards SALT, perhaps because it does have this expectant category. Um, and so here at LHSC, we have switched to SALT triage um, over the last two or three years. So make sure you're familiar with which system uh, your hospital and your location does use, but we'll be focusing on SALT here. And so we've actually done studies here uh, in London using the SALT triage system and comparing how EMS, fire, and police uh, perform on SALT triage. So this is after uh, people have had a 30-minute training session in SALT, and these were all um, emergency response uh, personnel or students who had not been exposed to any uh, mass casualty training before. So they had a 30-minute course followed by a test, and then they had a repeat test. That's those follow-up columns that you'll see. Um, that was performed three months later. And as you can see, uh, EMS uh, students performed very well on their um, tests, both initially and at three months. Fire also performed uh, quite well. Police, unfortunately, didn't have the same uh, results. This is probably because in their training they don't have any first aid um, and not nearly the same level of exposure to these types of things. So I think it was more difficult for them to adapt to, uh, to this system. But um, we also have results on the types of errors that uh, EMS, fire, and police tend to make when doing triage. And we do expect that there will be some level of over-triaging and under-triage, and we have acceptable limits to that. Um, the thing we like to minimize the most are critical errors. And as you can see here, those critical errors, which are the darkest bars, are very, very small um, for EMS and fire, um, which is excellent. And then over-triage, I just wanted to point out for EMS in particular, tended to be the error that we make uh, the most, and uh, that may be because we have additional knowledge and so we may see the complications of some of these injuries um, in advance, but try to stick to the protocol as best possible to avoid those errors, um, but also feel good that we are in an acceptable range when we have tested this, so um, have some confidence in your skills as well. So as already mentioned, um, the first step is to call out for any um, victims at the scene who are able to walk. Ask these people to move to designated areas. If you have tarps because a supervisor truck has arrived with them or you can mark out areas in different colors, that would be ideal. So get those victims headed to the right area. 
anyone who's waving, you can leave for the moment um, and then head out to the patients who are not responding and see if you can provide any of those life-saving interventions. So these are the bags we have on the trucks here at uh, London EMS. And um, they're on every truck. Inside the bag, we have tags. Unfortunately, we have not changed the equipment in the bag since we've switched to salt triage. So our tags are still the same from when we had the salt triage, but that should hopefully be changed in the near future. But for now, I would use the deceased um, symbol for either deceased or expectant. But these are the tags that you can put around a patient's neck so that you know who's been triaged and don't repeat work that others have already done. And that way, as well, um, police and fire, anyone who's helping you move patients who are immobile to the correct site, know how they have been triaged. And you also have your handy uh, SALT card with you, so you never have to rely on memory when you're in a stressful situation. There's also some uh, forms. Documentation tends to be a bit of an issue in these situations. Um, we tend to act first and then think about paperwork later. But if you're able to uh, remember, there are some uh, laminated cards that you can document uh, what trucks are arriving, which patient number they're transporting, and try and keep track of those things as best possible. Uh, and we also have some uh, safety kind of jackets and things that you can wear so that uh, you can stand out in the crowd. So we're going to start with um, a case example. So if you are the first responder to a passenger uh, train crash, you're going to assess the scene for safety. You'll set up a command post, and then you'll contact dispatch and the hospital while the second medic um, begins their triage process. So what information would you like to share with the hospital when you're giving them a call? And I'll give you a minute again to answer this question. Great, so it looks like we've got um, a ton of responses. I will close the poll and share the results. Looks like 96% of the audience has uh, chosen all of the above. Well done. Good. So I'm very glad. That was my easy one, just to get you guys into the uh, flow of questions here. Um, but yeah, obviously there's a lot of important information that you want to provide when you do your uh, call to the hospital, but these would be, um, in our minds, I think, kind of the top four things that you really want to provide to the hospital. Exactly. And this provides the, the key pieces of information that we're going to need at, from a hospital response time, because it tells us, you know, what capacity we need to develop. It tells us the timeline that we need to have that capacity and also what additional resources we need to start considering for our response. All right, so we just spoke about that. Um, so now we're just going to go through a few questions. So this is all related to that first case that I mentioned uh, where you've responded to a passenger train crash and we're going to go through some patient presentations and uh, how you would like to respond to them. So in this case, uh, who would you like to assess first? All right, so we have a good number of responses here, and it looks like 96% of you absolutely did the right thing, did not get distracted by the screaming child. Um, you want to assess the person who is breathing but unresponsive and uh, have that person brought to the hospital first. So excellent job there. And so again, this is just reiterating that step one of the SALT triage is um, assess those who are not moving and have an obvious threat to life first followed by those with purposeful movements, uh, who can obey commands, and then lastly, anyone who is walking. All right, so another one here. You come across a young adult who is unresponsive. 
They have agonal breathing, obvious jugular vein distension, and a trachea that is deviated towards the left. What life-saving intervention, if any, would you perform on this patient? Okay, we'll go ahead and close that one and share the results. Looks like we're, we're close between B and C. So um, this is one of the things with salt triage that I do want to stress, and I'm actually glad we got a bit of a split answer there. Um, it is appropriate to perform a life-saving intervention if you can do it quickly. So if you have a bag on you and you can perform something quickly like a needle decompression, then that is very appropriate to do so. If that is unsuccessful, but you've performed the procedure properly, don't wait and continue treating. Um, at that point, you consider it unsuccessful um, and put them in the uh, more expectant category. But you can stop very, very briefly to perform um, a life-saving intervention. Again, the goal is to keep it under about 30 seconds per patient. Um, so assess, do your um, life-saving intervention, and move on. Other life-saving interventions that I would consider doing would be application of a tourniquet um, or having, if there is, you know, a bystander who can someone apply um, pressure to a wound and see if um, that changes your triage at that point. So here that is in that section of your uh, SALT triage. Those are the life-saving interventions that are considered on that triage sheet. Um, and then you move on to the next part of your algorithm. So next question, we have an 82-year-old male. He is not waving or moving on command. He is lying in a large pool of blood. His left lower extremity is amputated above the knee and actively hemorrhaging. He is unresponsive, has a weak carotid pulse, occasional shallow respirations. A tourniquet is applied to the uh, left lower extremity, but his bleeding continues. How would you like to triage this one? I'm impressed with how quickly uh, the audience is responding here. Well done. We'll close that one, share the results. I think we're at 81% labeling this uh, expectant. Absolutely. So this patient is in that expectant category, and I like to put this question up here because I think that's a difficult category for us to put people in when normally we have one victim and we often are able to do a lot more for them. So this is a difficult decision to make. Um, from an emotional perspective, I think, on scene. So um, keep these cases in mind. But again, very algorithmic. And I think you all went through it uh, very well looking at those four questions. You've already provided your possible life-saving um, measure of a tourniquet. It didn't help you. So in this case, still not responsive, um, still not breathing, so um, or you know, agonal respiration. So they would go into that expectant category. Well done. All right, we're going to have another one. So 18-year-old male does not move when instructed, but is able to wave. He has a left leg injury that is spurting blood. His peripheral pulses are 110 beats per minute, and he has a respirate of 20. A tourniquet is applied to his leg, and the bleeding is controlled. How would you like to triage this one? So we're looking at 71% uh, of the audience and labeling this one immediate. Excellent. Okay. So this one I wouldn't call immediate. Um, I would actually call this one delayed. So in this case, um, the patient um, is has their bleeding controlled. Um, 
so we can answer yes to that fourth question in the box there. So we actually move to the right on um, that algorithm. So I think the part that was probably confusing people was that it sounded like a pulsatile bleed with it spurting blood. But if you are able to control the bleeding with um, a tourniquet or with pressure, then you actually get to go to the right on the algorithm because you've said yes to major hemorrhage being controlled and they get put into either uh, minimal or delayed. And here I would put them into delayed over minimal because as I think most of you correctly identified, um, this person is not well and definitely needs to be taken to hospital quickly, but not as quickly as uh, someone else who may be in respiratory distress or have um, an uncontrolled limb bleed, for instance. And on this one, this is a 24-year-old male. Uh, he is able to wave and move when instructed. He has penetrating injuries with an avulsion to the upper arm and uncontrolled arterial bleeding that cannot be stopped from that site. He's oriented person in place. He does not know the date. His airway is clear and his respirations are rapid and labored. His pulse is weak and he states that he's thirsty and needs water. What would you do for this patient or how would you triage them? Okay, great job. We're seeing 87% uh, responding with immediate. All right, that one I agree. We are immediate. So this patient is responding, um, and although they're confused, uh, they are able to obey commands, make some purposeful movements, um, but they do not have um, a controlled hemorrhage. So we have said no to one of those questions there, so we get to move down on the algorithm. And that's where you decide, is this someone who would be put in the expectant category or immediate? I think with the fact that he's got uh, reasonable mental status, his breathing is good, um, we can put him in the immediate category and have them brought to hospital to have that, um, that uncontrolled bleed stopped. All right, so that's it for our questions. Um, I would encourage you to sit down with the algorithm and... Um, and go through those questions again um, in the next few days just to reiterate that in your mind. But I know many of you probably don't have that algorithm open as you're going through these questions right now, which makes it more difficult. At the time that you are actually doing this in the field, you will have your cheat sheet on the truck. So bring that cheat sheet with you. Um, this is not something you have to have memorized, but it is something you have to be familiar with and comfortable following uh, quickly and not have to study at the time that this happens. And so the most important things I want to stress here is to know your role. So as EMS, you want to set up that command post. As the first truck, that is your role. Um, so, um, you know, take some leadership and, and be confident in being that command post. Early notification to the hospital is very, very important so that they're ready for you when you arrive. And again, SALT triage, we've gone through a few examples that um, they can be sometimes a little bit tougher, so review that again and use your equipment on your truck and your colleagues um, effectively in these cases. Try to keep your triage to less than 30 seconds a patient. If you do have to try um, a life-saving measure, perform that as quickly as you can and then move on. Um, encourage the patients to stay on scene, as we already mentioned. Use those tags in your bag and document as best you can. So those would be our biggest pieces of advice for you going forward. If anyone has any more questions, I don't know if we had any more sent in here. So there's, there's a bunch of questions about the hospital emergency response team, including its training and, and how it's trained, as well as um, some very specific questions about hospital uh, decant. Um, instead of sort of trying to do it in this uh, form, if whoever wants uh, has those specific questions, wants to touch base with the base hospital, they can put you in touch with me and we can... Uh, have specific discussions about your questions in the in that realm and those and those issues. Perfect. We do have one question. I wonder if um, Chantal, perhaps you can go back to the slide with the patient um, that had agonal respirations and maybe go through the chart again with that one. Is that possible? Absolutely. Try and find it here. Was that the agonal resps? The expectant. Yeah. 
So. Okay. Um, so I'll go through this case again. So um, this is an 82-year-old male. He is not waving or moving on command, um, and he is lying in a pool of blood. He has a large left lower leg injury with an amputation that is bleeding, and uh, we cannot stop the bleeding with a tourniquet applied. He's also unresponsive, has a weak pulse, and uh, shallow respirations. So if we follow the algorithm, um, we've already done our step one where he's not responding, so he'd be one of the first people assessed on scene. Then when we go to step two, we provide life-saving interventions. That was um, applied. He had a tourniquet applied, and uh, the bleeding continued. And was he breathing? Yes, shallow breathing, so we can say yes to that. And then we go through these questions. Do they obey commands? He's a no. Um, so that automatically pushes us down on that um, list. But if we go through the others, he has weak pulses, um, he is in respiratory distress, and also has a major hemorrhage that is not controlled. So when we go to the next part and we decide, is this someone who's likely to survive or not, I would say when they answer yes to all four of those questions in the gray box, or sorry, no to all those questions where they do not have purposeful movements, they have um, an active bleed, if we have all of those answers are no, the chances of this patient surviving are quite low. If they only have one of those as um, a no, uh, then I would consider maybe putting them in the immediate category. And these are the, the most difficult patients to assess. That, that last uh, question between immediate and expectant is, is probably the hardest question to answer. And it very much does depend on the current resources. If you were in a mass casualty with 50 plus, 50 plus very sick patients, um, then this patient probably is not likely going to survive given the resources that you currently have. If you were on scene with three patients, uh, then there's the potential that, you know, you have the resources to transport that patient to hospital and there is the potential they may survive. So it really does come down to what is your current resource status? How many, how many patients do you have? How many uh, EMS vehicles do you have? How many uh, care uh, or responders do you have available to care for these patients? And if you don't have the resources, then you make them expectant. That doesn't mean that you do nothing. It, it just means that you're going to move on and deal with the immediate uh, patients first and then come back. And when you have the resources available, this patient may become an immediate and be transported to hospital, but they're not going to be your priority right now. And I think there was another one that we struggled with a bit in terms of having a disparity of answers. I just want to see um, if that was the correct question. Um, I think it may have been one of the first ones. I'm trying to find it. It was the first one that they wanted? Okay. Was that the deceased patient? Oh, sorry, this is the performing a life-saving intervention? Yes, this one. Okay, so for this question, um, this is a patient who, based on this presentation, looks like they probably have um, a tension pneumothorax. So things we look for uh, with that is um, difficulty with uh, breathing. We look for those uh, distended jugular veins and tracheal deviation. So um, in this case, it would be appropriate if you recognize those signs and symptoms. Obviously, that's, you know, very, um, it's easy when it's written down. But if you can recognize that they look like they're in a uh, tension pneumothorax situation, then it's appropriate to uh, decompress the chest. It would even be appropriate to decompress uh, both sides of the chest if necessary, if you weren't able to tell uh, which side, but they had uh, difficulty breathing, you could decompress both sides, see if there's any benefit, and move on. So, uh, okay. As long as it's within their scope of practice. Oh. I think you True. hit on that, uh, Mike. If we talk about different scope of practices, so a PCP who cannot provide needle decompression, uh, does that change the way that we triage the patient? So it would not change the way you would triage the patient. Um, you would perform what's in your scope of practice within those life-saving interventions and then move on to the next patient. If you do happen to know that there is someone else at the scene that is an ACP who may be able to provide that, 
I don't think it's unreasonable to call them over and ask them to perform that task while you move on to the next patient. Um, but if it's only PCPs at the scene and you cannot perform it, only do what's in your scope of practice, even in an emergency situation, and, and jump to the next patient. And that's exactly it. It, it, it. The intervention doesn't change how you triage them. The outcome of the intervention may change how you triage them. So if you need, if you, if it's within your scope to decompress this patient, and you decompress them, and all of a sudden now they're, they are no respiratory distress. There's no uncontrolled hemorrhage. Their mental status normal, and at that point, then they may not be as immediate as if the needle decompression doesn't, uh, isn't able to be performed. So it's, the outcome of the procedure may change it, but the, the lack of being able to do it doesn't change how you would triage the patient. Okay, great. Um, Chantal, can you move to slide, I believe, 32, where we had a patient who um, had a spurting leg injury with a tourniquet applied. So with the tourniquet applied, the patient now no longer has a peripheral pulse. So the question is, does that now change your triage? Because there is no peripheral pulse, however, the bleeding is now controlled. And the answer is no, the, it doesn't change your triage. The peripheral pulse is a generic term for peripheral pulses, so making sure that they have adequate perfusion. Um, so do they have a radial or a pulse, essentially is do they, can you feel a pulse? The fact that you put a tourniquet on and, and occlude the pulse in that limb uh, doesn't change the fact that somewhere on that patient they have a peripheral pulse. Okay, and one last question from the operational side, uh, I'm not sure if you can answer this. Do you know, um, Mike, probably if um, service operators can choose different um, MCI triaging methods? I can't speak uh, specifically. My understanding is that they can because I know locally uh, MLEMS is using the SALT triage, uh, has done SALT triage training with their, uh, with their crews. Um, so my understanding is from that, but yes, they can choose which one. I think it's, it's a question of you have to have a triage tool. Uh, as well as uh, training in its application. And everybody in the service has to be using the same. Great, thanks. That's all the questions that I have coming through. Is there anything else that you guys would like to add? I don't think so. I think uh, we're good at this time. So thank you guys for uh, taking part in the presentation. I hope this was helpful to you and uh, you'll feel a little bit more confident going into a mass casualty situation if you do come across one. Great. Thanks a lot to our presenters and thank you to the audience for attending. Uh, do keep an eye on our website and on your email. We will send out notification of any future webinars. Have a great day, guys.